Hello, so, everyone, and welcome to oh, sorry, Garfield. <laughs> welcome to tonight's presentation of OTF Connects, building a community of thinkers with Garfield Jimmy Newman of the Critical Thinking Consortium. Um, as always, uh, Sirius Gurhan says thank you. Uh, she's the administrator and facilitator of the OTF Connects program, and we're always excited to see so many teachers who are willing to uh, share some of their time and learning. Um, with their colleagues across the province while it's on your own time and uh, and we can see where everybody is across the province tonight and welcome to those of you who are just joining in right now and uh, we're always thrilled to have Garfield with us uh, sharing the rich resources of TC squared and uh, encouraging you to foster critical thinking in different ways in your classroom and in tonight's uh, session uh, it's going to be helping you build a community of thinkers so I will hand things over to you now Garfield. Thank you. And, and Zoe, I like your suggestion for the Ottawa peeps to have a party. Uh, I'm actually sitting in the Marriott Hotel in Ottawa tonight, uh, although I'm from Caledon East. Um, but here with the Ottawa Carleton Board today and tomorrow with the Ottawa Catholic Board. And Thursday I'm off to Kansas City to work with arts educators in Kansas City. So uh, that's my week. Um, I have to also uh, echo um, Louise's uh, comment. I, I'm uh, always amazed at the dedication of teachers. Like that when I look at the list of people tonight, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of us are getting tired. It's been a long winter, um, it's been a long cold winter, and, and I sense in schools that we're, we're tired. We need a, we need a break. Um, so it it's just speaks to your commitment. Um, to, to see how many people give up a chunk of their evening. So thanks so much. Um, so uh, let's move on. And uh, by the way, I think uh, last week, Susan and Michelle, I was in, uh, oh, what school was it? I was at in, in Waterloo, um, in Hespler, um, at, at a school working with staff and parents. So uh, Waterloo is where I did my undergraduate um, at Laurier. I'm a Laurier grad, and so it's good to be out that, that way. So we're going to talk tonight uh, a bit about building a community of thinkers. Uh, uh, Roberta, I think we're still referred to as the high school down the street uh, by, by the folks down at Waterloo, but uh, anyway, we will endure. So we're going to talk about this, and I'm hoping tonight, uh, heads up, uh, Louise mentioned we're going to watch some videos. Uh, so I'm hoping that works. Uh, we, I sent them in advance, and Louise has uploaded one wooden load. We'll try and play it from my computer. If not, we'll try to talk around it. So just you know, in case the technology fails us a little, uh, we'll, we'll give it our best shot. So when we talk about a community of thinkers, uh, you'll sometimes see in literature and conversations people talk about creating communities of learners. Uh, so th th although there are similarities, there is a, a, a difference. Um, oh, great. Uh, kindergarten, French, thanks, Zoe. Um, I was just dealing with kindergarten teachers today at the school I was at at Orlean Woods. Uh, the community of thinkers is, is, is not just learning together, but in a mutually supportive way that where, where students uh, and teachers learn in an environment where thinking is, is supported and, and promoted, um, and, and we'll explore what that looks like. And uh, I wanted you just to take a minute, and I'm hoping in the chat window, and it looks like we have a fairly active group using the chat window, um, I've given you just some images to spur your, your thinking. Could you type in the chat window, what does a community of thinkers look like and sound like? Um, you could also, inspired by some of the pictures, put what it does not. Just, just clarify if you could. Uh, it is not this or it is this. So uh, good. So that, that's a good start. Uh, Teacher-centered. It should be interactive, whereas these seem to be very teacher-centered. Inclusive. Great, lots of clarifying questions, engaged. Okay. Oh, I like that, loud. Uh, by the way, uh, the top right picture is a medical school class in China. Um, I also want you to take a, a look at the bottom left certainly has lots of technology 
um, available. Let me just ask that one in particular. Is the bottom left, and, and, and I know you have to answer this depends, and so certainly put that in. Is the bottom, what evidence is there that the bottom left picture with all the laptops is or is not a community of thinkers? What evidence would you have or uh, what would you infer from? What, what um, okay, so it is because we're doing it now. What assumptions are you making then, Roberta, in terms of what people are doing on their computers that would have you say, I think this is a community of thinkers? And is there anyone who can make a case that I think it's not a community of thinkers? And here's why. Just if you just take a minute. Uh, I'm looking at the, at the bottom left in particular. Okay, so they could be. They're, they're not all on the same page. Their screens show us that. So they're they're, they're working. Ah, okay, I, uh, Jeremy, thank you. The assumption that they're connecting. So remember, we are here talking about a community of thinkers. So if they're a community, uh, I love Susan's point. Are they using some kind of social media? Are they interacting with each other in some way? Uh, or are they, uh, you know, are they isolated behind the screen? So one of the important questions in a community of thinkers, how are they collaborating? How are they challenging each other's thinking? Uh, if they are posting, sharing, um, and so on, we would say that we have a community of thinkers. If they are online reading their own stuff, then, then they're not. So uh, sometimes it's tough just by the image. What about the top left? So she's using a nice little promotion for an interactive whiteboard. Uh, what do you think? Is that a community of thinkers? Can you suggest ways that it could be uh, better used to promote a community of thinkers? So uh, I see Zoe prefers the circle as a way to engage kids in the community where everyone's equal. The, the whiteboard, uh, we do have some hands up, but this, as some of you have pointed out, it's still the teacher controlling and, and you know, the kids are still responding to the teacher. So is there a way that, that we, you know, so getting kids to the board, sharing their thinking, challenging each other? Okay. Interesting point. Uh, that the, the, the learners in, in many of the images look fairly passive, that they're not necessarily involved. So what I want to try to do is I'm going to get you to, uh, and I'll explain my choices in a moment, but I'm going to have you take a look at, at two, uh, well, I'll say people in education roles, uh, to have you think about who is more effective at nurturing a community of thinkers. And this is where we're going to try uh, to see if the technology works for us. We're going to take a look at Mad-Eye Moody from Harry Potter teaching the Defense Against the Dark Arts class. And we're going to uh, look at Dr. Greg House, who, as Roberta says, is kind of grumpy. And in fact, I want to point out to you, the reason I've chosen these two, I want you to think about what makes an effective community of thinkers. If I showed you, um, I don't know, a, a, a clip from a classic scene like Dead Poet Society where you know Robin Williams is the teacher that we all think is being wonderful. I don't really push your thinking if I give you a, a, someone who is obviously doing what we would want them to do. I'm going to show you two people, as you pointed out, is grumpy or can be nasty. And you may at first blush say, I don't see any redeeming features. But I want you to think about how are they um, how are they promoting thinking, or are they? And you may decide that they're not. But I want to show you when we do this activity, and here's a sample thinking strategy that just models critical thinking that I can also get you thinking about community thinkers, or you can adapt this for use with your students. So we would build uh, three criteria for establishing a community of thinkers. So you'll notice the three I'm going to suggest. The students are expected to make up their own mind. They, they can't simply accept someone's word for things. They, they have to make up their own mind by thinking through. That they're expected, as, as a matter of course, to provide evidence or samples or reasoning for their decision. That they can't simply take a position without thinking about it. And that they have to consider a variety of perspectives on an issue not, and seriously weigh options and look at alternatives before reaching their conclusion. So students have to make up their own mind, provide evidence to support, and have considered a variety of options. As we watch, hopefully, the clips, what I would ask you to do is, in this case, I've got Greg House, 
what evidence is there that the factor is missing, that he does not show that? What evidence is there that the factor is present? And then in the end, we can weigh the evidence and decide, does he do an excellent job? Does he do a decent job, but some factors are, are not addressed well? Does he do a poor job? Now, we would do this for both uh, Moody and Greg House. So let's try it. Uh, we're going to see uh, how the technology goes. So uh, we're going to launch the video. Please uh, quickly throw up a note if, if you can't hear or it's not working on your end so that, that we can troubleshoot. But we'll give it a shot. Uh, Louise, do you launch it from your end or do I launch it? I'll get it started here for you. So folks, I'm going to drop the link here and your uh, whiteboard's going okay. to turn into a web tour, but the link is now also in the chat as well. So if the web tour doesn't work, click on the link in the chat. And when you're done the video, give us a green check mark. Okay, my mic's on, um, and if we can switch back over to the slides. So before we, uh, I have you answer my question. If you had to say to my students, my, my, my teacher candidates at the Faculty of Education, three things that you saw Moody do in that clip they should not do in their practice teaching block, could you list three things, or list one thing? List, what, what did he do that you would say to a beginning teacher, you do not want to be doing that in your class? Tell me uh, three things or one thing that they should not do. Just, uh, let's see if we can generate a quick list. <laughs> uh, Zoe, you have a, a comment. Why don't you jump on the mic? I would say singling students out and scaring them, but I found it, on the other hand, quite effective to teach them not to use the curse. To that. Uh, so look at all the lists. By the way, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, no one yet has said don't drink in class, I don't think. That will be my addition to it. At the end, he pulls out his flask and has a drink. Um, but look at the list and how quickly we can say, well, don't put kids in danger, don't kill things in class, don't yell at kids, don't intimidate. I would argue that I haven't asked you to think too deeply to generate that list. That's a, that's a pretty easy listing of things where I didn't push your thinking too hard. But where I do, I know there's Zoe at the end, but I did find it pretty effective for us. I want to back you up. Forget this says Greg House, just imagine it says Moody. If you could just take a moment and, and give me some evidence that you think he did meet or did not meet. So we've got three criteria. Were learners expected to make up their own mind or were they to simply accept information? Were they to provide reasons? Were they to consider a variety of perspectives? So if you could just take a minute, and what I want to do is set aside the fact that he was doing lots of things that we shouldn't do in the class. Was there any redeeming uh, feature to what he was doing that we could learn from and say, well, actually, that was effective? What would that be? Sorry, can I I'll answer my, my question again? Uh, just a so my question is, what evidence, and it's just looking at my chart, what evidence in that clip do you have that he either met the criteria or he did not meet the criteria? So in the end, were there any redeeming features of that clip that said, actually, that's a good idea for building a community of thinkers? Or would you say, no, that was a good example of what not to do? So if you look at my chart, what support would you have to say he did not meet your criteria or what support that he did? So I'm seeing uh, he did get them to consider perspectives or think of alternatives. Um, he grounded the, the learning in authentic, uh, relevant tasks. Okay, gave an example for students to evaluate. Good. I think, Susan, uh, your point's a good one that, that um, 
that much of the good that might be in the lesson will get lost if kids don't feel safe. That, and by the way, uh, you know, I should have been very clear, this is not to propose that we adopt any of the practices, but it is to say, uh, you know, what might get lost, what might, what might we miss, uh, given the things that we don't like that actually did have some features. Ah, so he, uh, Louise points out he did pose a challenge. But uh, by the way, I like no, notice now, uh, Michael saying that but students were afraid to make up their own line. So they were trying to make sure they gave the right answer. So that's good evidence that, that, the, that the factor was missing, that they were simply reciting information. They weren't making up their, so remember, they weren't making up their own minds. Okay. Wonderful. Look at the way of what I'm loving that you're doing is citing some evidence to meet the criteria. So notice now what I want to show you, first of all, first of all, from a critical thinking lens, I'm moving the conversation from did you like Moody, would you want him as your teacher, which is a column two or a preference or an emotional response, to were there any redeeming qualities that we could take from this, which pushes the thinking. Now, we're going to try uh, the house uh, the house clip. We couldn't find the clip, so I'm going to have to try to play from my computer. If not, I'll try to ex explain as best I can. Uh, so I believe, um, Louise, I need to share my desktop. Is that correct? Yeah, as long as your video is uh, the top thing behind Blackboard on your desktop. It is, but now I've got this waiting for application sharing to start spinning. So yeah. you don't have the little pop-up box asking you to pick desktop or the application. Not. Hmm. No, then it says send key. Oh, it's doing that. Okay. Um. Oh. Let's see, if we go back to the whiteboard for a second, can you try choosing it from the tools menu instead? Or did you already? OK, well, can you stop? Okay, right now it's stuck on waiting for application again. Oh, uh, you know what? I wonder if it's for right All right. Yeah, go to tool no, menu. And then under the application sharing, you should be able to do share entire desktop. Yeah, but it, it just is send key for me. Really? So, uh, did you receive the large file? Were you able to open the large file? No, it wouldn't. That was I was able to download it, but it didn't let me open it. Wouldn't open. All right. No. All right. So I'll have to. I don't want to uh, waste too much time. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to let me uh, to share my black my. So, what we'll do? Let me just explain to you the clip. Uh, <coughs> Uh, let, let me, um, so those of you who have not uh, seen House, uh, how many of you have not watched the, the show House in the past? Just if we can get a, a check mark if you've never seen House, just a couple of you. Okay, so let me try to describe him a little bit. Uh, Greg House was uh, an absolutely brilliant doctor. Um, his specialty was uh, diagnostics. Uh, but he was a very grumpy, um, nasty bedside manner, would tell people uh, what he thought. You know, uh, he'd say things like, everybody lies, um, uh, that you're a moron, um, you know, these kind of things. So he, he could be very, very mean. In the episode I wanted to show you, he was ordered by, uh, by, the, by his boss to teach a medical school class. And so he's telling students a story or three stories, in fact, and they have to try to figure out uh, what's, you know, diagnose the patient, basically. And at one point, he asks, uh, he, he colors a circle with a number of colors, and he holds it up, and he asks the students, uh, you know, what, what is this? And he said, that's tea colored, right? And he asks the students, so what would cause uh, urine that is tea colored. And someone says, uh, one of the uh, young girl students in the class uh, says blood in the urine. He, he walks up to her and he says, what color is your blood? She said red. What color is your pee? She said yellow. What colors did I use? She, he said, she says yellow, red, 
and and brown. What causes brown? Um, and and she says, um, oh, what did she say? Um, anyway, the kidneys are shutting down. What else? What else might be causing this? She has another answer. What if I told you this? What does that tell you? Eventually, she says, she says I don't know. Um, sorry, I just see a note. Can someone hear me okay? I just I saw a note. Yeah, okay, good, thanks. So um, and then he says to her, you're useless. And he walks down and he goes to another student. And he says, uh, the trauma diagnosis is right, breast, he, he'll be fine. He says, are you sure? The student says, yes. How says, um, he says, you know what's worse than useless? Useless and oblivious. And another student says, well, it's kind of hard to think with you in our face like this. And how says, well, you think it's going to be easier when you've got a real patient really dying? What are they missing? And then one of the fellow doctors who's come into the back of the room says, muscle death. And House says, it's not your case. And she said, there's nothing wrong with a consult. And the first student, the young girl who he told was useless, pipes in and says, muscle death uh, creates my, uh, myoglobin. It leaks into the blood. And, and she explains it. And House says, brilliant. And he stops. Now, I apologize. It's not as good as watching the clip. But when we look at what many people will say is, well, you know, he was beautiful. Look what you're saying. They need to be challenged. By the way, I want you to think about his audience. His audience is med school students, not grade two students. These are people who are going into a high stress field. He's pushing them to think. He's putting them on the spot. And most people I've talked to say he does a better job at creating a community of thinkers because as you're pointing out, he doesn't give them answers, but he does give them evidence. So notice we call this additive teaching. He kept dropping in new pieces of information or evidence. He would he creates a community of thinkers by posing a provocative challenge, ask them to think about it, and then every time they give an answer, he gives them some new information to think about. Or what about this? So so you'll notice he certainly forces them to consider approaches. He certainly asks them to use evidence to support their reasoning. He expects them to be able to come up with an answer to support. Uh, so I want you to when you watch it, it's actually a brilliant bit of teaching if, and by the way, I want to go back to something someone said earlier. You said, yeah, but the negativity would shut down. I can guarantee you in elementary, even in high schools, he would not have the impact he wants because he would just turn people off from his sarcastic and, and nasty tone. But the criteria, <laughs> I love the point you just made, the criteria does not have to say he's polite. Does he create a community? Yes. He forces them to think. He forces them to use evidence. He forces them to consider alternatives. When, if I did not give you, by the way, this challenge of my criteria, you would watch the clip and tell me again what not to do, why he's not a good teacher. But with the criteria, we pause and go, actually, there are some worthwhile. And I have to tell you, I think there's many things I could take from that house clip, if you get a chance to watch it. Uh, by the way, it's episode one. This, and the uh, sorry, it's season one, and the episode is called Three Stories. And so you can you can probably find a YouTube clip on it, or you can probably find it on Netflix. Uh, season one, um, Three Stories. Oh, thank you. Uh, it is some really interesting to watch it through the lens of a community of thinkers that he actually does some really effective things that I would guess many of us could modify and take out the sarcasm and the attack and still use the approach. So I don't want to belabor it. Uh, oh, there is a picture of our, our buddy Greg. So I just want us to be thinking about when we talk about building a community of thinkers, what do we mean by that? Uh, who is involved in that? Uh, it's our classroom. So who is in our classroom? The students, the, the teachers. Uh, what about within a department at a, at a high school? What about within the broader school? So for example, uh, I would invite in a school a principal to think about how, how do you run your school as a community of thinkers? If it's top-down direction, we really don't have a community of thinkers. If, it's, um, you know, if we're thinking in a school, how do, we, how do we adopt policies? How do we address issues? How do we, how do we decide what professional learning to engage in? 
that, if we are a true community of thinkers as a school, uh, needs to involve more people. How do we involve parents as a true community? So I, what I'm challenging you to think about is that a community of thinkers should not simply mean our classroom when we close the door, but how do we function as a staff and as a broader community in terms of decision making and so on? So I, I'm going to just pause again and ask you for a moment if, if you could, uh, if, if I were to uh, uh, come into your class as a fly on the wall, uh, what would I see in here? And if you could just give me some thoughts around critical thinking in the classroom and, and that community piece. So we want to kind of bring two together. Uh, how would a silent observer simply uh, watching a class, how would we, what, what happens in your class that people would observe kids in, in thoughtful discourse and in, in sharing their thinking and making decisions? If you could just t take a minute and jot down a few things that, that happens in classrooms on a daily basis that helps promote that kind of thinking without the sarcasm and insults, what would that look like? So just as a, as a few of these are rolling past, I just want to make a, you know, a few observations. Uh, and, and I really like, uh, Jeremy, I like the paraphrasing. Tell me more. Uh, uh, is this what you mean? And we'll talk a bit about that. Um, I have to tell you, when, when my students return from their practice teaching block, I often end up having to tell them the most underused uh, tactic that I see from my students is think, pair, share. And I see, you know, I suggest think, pair, share, and group discussion. I see far too often my students as beginning teachers posing a good question but taking the first hand that goes up uh, or using a check for understanding like, does anyone have any questions? Uh, does everyone understand? And I have to repeatedly tell them that is not an effective check for understanding. But if I use a think, pair, share, and the other thing I have to tell my students, when you use a think, pair, share, don't stand at the front of the class and give them a minute while you shuffle papers. Get out amongst the students and eavesdrop. Listen in. What are the kids saying? I can use that then to decide what student to call on for an answer. I can use it to shape. I can see where misunderstandings and shapes where I take the lesson next. So think, pair, share, I think, as you say here, is, is vital and, and an important uh, and probably underutilized. Uh, one other piece, uh, brainstorming in groups. So I just want to uh, make two comments on brainstorming. First of all, uh, brainstorming can inadvertently undermine creativity in our class uh, if, and let me, the, the if is an important qualifier, brainstorming works best if we allow students a bit of time to think on their own, 30 seconds or a minute, before they start brainstorming. And the reason for that is when we ask students to turn to a partner, like right off the bat, turn to a partner and share an idea, we've created social stress for some kids that they're expected to perform on the spot, even if it's one other student, and maybe they don't have an idea, and it can cause them to shut down a bit. So allowing, I want you to think for 30 seconds on your own, allow students to gather their thoughts, and then invite them to, to brainstorm. The second piece I want to share, brainstorming is wonderful for fluency. It generates ideas. The critical thinking comes when we ask students to do what we call uh, brain steering. So brain steering is when we ask students, uh, you have 10 good ideas that you guys have generated. Pick two that you think are the most worthwhile. Or maybe I wouldn't even say you have 10 good ideas. Generate as many, you've got 10 ideas on the table. Really, uh, really interesting and range, good range, but they're not all helpful. Brain steering is when we take brainstorming to the next step and we say, working with your partner, decide which of those ideas are worth keeping and which to throw out. And that's where we push the critical thinking piece. So brain steering, an interesting uh, opportunity. All right. So what we want to do is explore uh, how do we create an atmosphere conducive to a community of thinkers? What, what does that look like? I, I want us to share some, some thoughts around practices that can undermine and practices that can support a community of thinkers. 
So one of the things to think about, front-end loading content or teaching answers actually will undermine a community of thinkers because the message kids are getting is that you have to sit and passively receive information before we get to the discussion or before we get to the interesting task. Or they pick up the sense that teachers teach answers and our job is to remember answers for when we're called upon. And so that learning is accepting answers uh, provided by the teacher. Uh, practices that support a community of thinkers is notice my shift from teaching answers to teaching the intellectual tools that allow the students to arrive at their own answers. So that's an important distinction there. That, that my mantra with students would be, I don't teach answers. I teach you the tools you will need to allow you to arrive at an answer. And, and by the way, an important distinction here, I think it's very important that people understand that content is a tool for learning. It's not the end in itself. So content is the tool. You can't make a thoughtful decision about the issue I've asked you to think about if you don't know anything about the topic. So do I teach content? Yes, I teach it as a tool that will allow teach, uh, students to draw conclusions or to arrive at their own answers. So if I teach correct answers, I'm going to undermine my community because be kids begin to think about, um, so what's the teacher's answer? And I don't front end load content. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, you know, I would start with a provocative question. What's the provocation that's driving my lesson? Let kids weigh in, debate, think about. Let me pause and, and Roberta, get your thought or your, your comment. Thanks. I wonder if you could talk about the three before me. I sometimes am concerned that perhaps an answer might be incorrect or the person might be misguided when they go to a, a peer for an answer. I'm thinking more in the younger grades, like maybe grade three. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so notice one of the things we're trying to do here is, is, is build that, that sense of that we're a community uh, in this together. I'm going to come to Roberta's question in just one second. So the idea of three before me, if, if you've not used it, is that students are not allowed to come and ask me a question until they've asked at least three other people. And so the process is I'm unclear about, uh, I don't know, how I solve this problem or what this word means or whatever it might be. And the students are expected to go to one other person, ask them. If they're not sure, go to another person. And if they're not sure, go to a third. If none of them can answer, all four of you should come up to me and say, we're confused. Can you help us with this? The first thing I would do, by the way, is pause the class and ask, can anyone, here's a question people are stuck on, who can help them? And if no one can help them, I know I need to reteach. Now, Roberta's concern was, well, what if I turn to that first or that second person? And they give me an incorrect answer with confidence. And so we all think all is good. Uh, one of the things I think that's really important is this is why that constant monitoring, that, uh, that wandering about as kids are engaged in these conversations is really important. Uh, so that I can listen in on conversations so it's, it, notice if, I, if I'm stuck at the front doing whatever else and I don't monitor that, I'm going to have trouble. But if I'm wandering about and I'm listening and chatting with kids, and this is the observation conversation part of our assessment, and I notice that the student has an erroneous or false or an incorrect answer, and I ask them, so why do you think that's the case? Well, this student told me. Okay, so I can see I've got to deal with this. So I think, uh, Roberta, your caution is a very important one. Um, how do we ensure that the answer students are arriving at are sound answers. So when we debrief, now why would you think that? How many others would think that? Okay, I need to, to, um, to troubleshoot this. So uh, I think it's an important piece. On the other hand, if students see me as the source of all answers, I don't build that community. So I think we want to in encourage students to talk with each other, and then we want to make sure through our conversations that, that they, um, Yes, do open-ended questions, but we monitor for the soundness of those answers and we're prepared to step in. Uh, I, Harry Potter, which I, I didn't um, show you. Um, well, I, I showed you a part of it, but I, but I didn't uh, show you a complete piece. Often in Harry Potter, when a question is posed, Hermione's quick to answer. And I want you to think that undermines a community of thinkers. When we allow uh, two or three students to, to dominate, other kids start to learn, keep your mouth shut and your head down, and, and the class will move along. And it undermines a, a, a community. What I need to do is, is, is and I want you to note, and I, and I said this a bit earlier when you had raised it, think, pair, share, distributes discussion, allowing kids time to think on their own, share a thought, 
uh, with a partner and then share with the class. I, again, I think it's so important that we're wandering about eavesdropping in on those conversations so that when I hear an interesting comment, especially from a student who, who typically does not want to offer a lot of answers, I can say to that student, you know, that was a brilliant idea. Would you mind sharing that with the class? And if the child is shy and says, no, I say, do you mind if I share it? I loved your answer. I'm trying to build their confidence that they have something to contribute. And by using Think, Pair, Share, I can increase the level of participation in my class creating the community, and I can better direct the conversation. By the way, the flip side, if I'm wondering about listening in on a conversation, and I notice that one group is really not getting this, their, their, their answers are, are, and I know I'm going to have to support them, I also know not to call on them because I'm simply going to expose them to offering an answer that doesn't make sense. So Think, Pair, Share gives me a chance to listen in, to, to, to kind of take a temperature check, and then to, to strategically call on students to provide answers. Um, and lastly, formative assessment that, that's predominantly given by teachers, again, tells kids that assessment is in the hands of the teacher. In other words, I, I call this an inquisition of student work. That, um, that students work on, on whatever task we give them, and then they hold their breath and wait while we pass judgment. Uh, if you want a true community of thinkers, we need to find more opportunities for that formative feedback loop uh, 